Hi, Alice. Wow. What have you done to the studio? I've refurbed it. What do you mean by refurb? It just feels like it's full of loads of weird stuff. Well, I, it was a bit plain before, and I just wanted to jazz it up a bit, give us something more befitting of our status. Yeah, okay. What is that? Um, so that's the kissing cupboard from the John Darwin series. Mm. If you look over there, there's the gold willy taps from the Litvinenko yeah, series. Yeah, I can't take my eyes off them. And what what is in that frame? What on earth is that? Oh, that's the five-breasted portrait of Mary Whitehouse from the BBC. <sighs> that, is, that is the stuff of nightmares, isn't it? I'm getting the sense this isn't up your street. I wouldn't say not up my street. I I would say I really, really actively hate it. Okay. (laughs) It's cost a fortune. I do need to talk to you about the financing, actually. Um, Do you know any lords? 5th of April, 2020. The Downing Street flat. Boris slowly props himself up in bed. His lungs burn. His body aches. He's never been in so much pain or felt so weak. He looks down at the iPad in front of him. A sea of worried faces stare back. It's his fourth meeting today, and all he wants to do is sleep. He declared lockdown 13 days ago. He'd hoped it would only last three weeks, but he's just read the latest figures on COVID infection rates, and they're startling. Numbers are rising by the day. Hospitals are struggling to cope. Everywhere, the death toll is mounting. It's so surreal hearing you say that because it was such a different time and obviously COVID is still very present. But at this point, so much was unknown. We didn't even know how you could catch it or how serious it would be if you did. There was no vaccine. There was no end in sight. And the idea that numbers were being floated about how long this could go on for. And I remember people saying, maybe in a year's time we won't be back to normal. And people saying, a year. That's ridiculous. That's completely over-dramatising the situation. We just had no grasp. Sir, we need to make a statement soon. He looks at the screen. He opens his mouth to answer, but his chest tightens. He hates being stuck here in this flat with no one to look after him. Dominic Cummings has left London. Carrie's gone to isolate at her own flat. A few times a day, someone knocks on the door and leaves food on a tray outside. But right now, he hasn't got the strength to climb out of bed to get it. Prime Minister, do we end lockdown or prepare for an extension? He hears his weary voice mutter he'll call them back in a few minutes. He lies still for a few moments, tries to gather his strength, then reaches for some painkillers. He has to fight through this. The last thing he wants is to end up in hospital with news bulletins speculating about whether he's fit to run the country. He can't catch his breath. He starts to panic. He climbs out of bed staggers to the door, drags himself to the top of the stairs. But his legs weaken, he crumples. He thinks to himself, am I dying? Is this it? Sir? He looks up at one of his aides rushing towards him, panic-stricken. He feels his body go limp and blacks out. From Wondery, I'm Matt Ford. And I'm Alice Levine. And this is British Scandal. So, Alice, what do you make of Boris Johnson? Do you think he's a shrewd political operator? Or does he get lucky on the back of other people's mistakes? Well, he has achieved the job he's been striving for for his entire life. But that does seem to have happened through the weaknesses of other people to a certain extent. So we've seen David Cameron making him mayor, Theresa May making that terrible decision, thinking she could control him if she made him foreign secretary. His timing alongside Jeremy Corbyn being as much about Corbyn as about his popularity. So we're left thinking, how much of this is down to his skill set and how much is the miscalculations of other people? Yes, and there's another group of people who are influential here because he's a magnet for a particular type of ambitious person who realises that they can effectively manipulate him for their own agenda. 
Yes, in the past, one of those key actors has been Michael Gove, but we've now been introduced to the new cast of allies. We've got Dominic Cummings, his chief advisor, and his girlfriend, soon to be wife, Carrie Simmons, who are going to be pivotal. They are. And we're about to see what happens when a group of people like this really start working against each other and the chaos that creates at the heart of government. This is more vicious and more power hungry than any other dynamic he's been involved in before. This is episode four, The Winner Takes It All. Two months earlier, 11pm, Friday the 31st of January 2020. The State Room, Downing Street. Boris stands in front of a portrait of Henry VIII, wedges himself between two Union Jack flags and raises his hands. He's invited 80 guests to Downing Street to count down the seconds until Britain leaves the EU, and he wants it to be spectacular. Ten, nine, eight... He'd wanted Britain's exit to be heralded by the sound of Big Ben, but it's under renovation and it won't chime. So instead, he picks up a miniature Chinese ornamental gong. Three, two, one. He hits the gong 11 times with a tiny mallet. My friends, we did it. We saw off the scaremongers and took back control. It's a fantastic moment in the life of our country. This is not the end. It's not even the beginning of the end. All the half in the middle. Classically clear there. He looks around at the puzzled faces, realises he doesn't know what he's saying himself. So he throws up his arms and declares, This is the beginning of the beginning. He looks over at Carrie. She blows him a kiss. He looks at the other end of the room, at Dominic Cummings. He's leaning against the doorpost, wiping a tear from his eye. He hauls Cummings to the front of the room. Oh, this is the man behind our success. It was Dom who came up with our slogans. Dom who steered us through. To Dom! He raises a glass of sparkling Kent wine, urges everyone to tuck into crab cakes, mini Yorkshire puddings with roast beef and shortbread with blue cheese. I'm not mad at that. That's a lovely beige spread, isn't it? Yes, there's not a hint of spice anywhere there, is there? <laughs> they watch the live feed on a giant TV screen of the crowds gathered outside the Houses of Parliament. Women on stilts in Union Jack costumes wave at the crowds. Boris feels a flush of pride as he notices someone with an I back Boris sign. But his grin falters when he hears his guests starting to chant, Dom, Dom, Dom. He looks over as someone slaps Cummings on the back, sees the delight spread over his face. And then the television breaks down. As his aides desperately try to get the live feedback, he feels Carrie at his side. Look at him. He loves all that attention. He follows her eyes to the small group around Cummings, watches them raise a toast to him. Why, it's his moment too. He deserves it. Surprisingly magnanimous of Boris there. He watches Carrie raise an eyebrow, then move away. He looks down into his glass of fizzy English wine, then back at the group around Cummings. He admires Dom, the way he gets things done. He likes his drive and focus and he's the most shrewd political advisor he's ever had. But maybe it wouldn't hurt to keep a closer eye on him from now on. A few days later, Sewn Britain showroom, Pimlico, London. Carrie wanders round the exclusive, perfectly lit showroom, runs her hand along the back of a blue velvet chair shaped like a shell gazes at the sumptuous hand-printed fabric hanging on the wall. She puts her hand on her baby bump. Which gets us up to a grand total of... some children. She's due to give birth in a few months, so she wants to get their flat in Downing Street ready. She reaches out to touch the red fern print fabric hanging in front of her. It's beautiful, isn't it? Handcrafted in Britain, of course. She turns to see a brightly dressed woman with straight shoulder-length hair. She smiles. Then her eyes dart back to the fabric. Carrie's always been in well-paid jobs. She's a media advisor, a highly skilled communicator, and she knows how to work a room. But this is the first time she's ever walked into a shop and not thought about the price. Can you imagine? Can you visit me at home with some samples? She quickly adds, 10 Downing Street. It's the flat in 11, actually. Just ask for Carrie. Gross. A day later, she sits with the interior designer Lulu Little. 
That can't be her real name. Posh people always shorten names, but make them more like florid, don't they? People are always called like Bunty, but their actual name is like Rebecca. Yes, or Kiki and it's Catherine. (laughs) Exactly. She watches Lulu smooth out her long blue dress as she takes notes. I'd like an antique double wing-back chair. Two sofas. I'll need those upholstered. Red fern fabric for the curtains. A card table. A drawing room lamp. And a spalier square wallpaper for the entrance hall. Need doing a lot of heavy lifting there. She glances at the designer's notepad. She's already spent £33,000 and she's hardly started. That night, she props herself up in bed as she looks over the estimate. Crosses out the £3,675 Nureyev gold drinks trolley. That is very frugal of her. Then hands the estimate to Boris. Watches as he jolts forward. He looks at her, shocked. I'm not paying for that. Carrie folds her arms. We can't live with all the stuff Theresa May chose. He snaps at her. Oh, well, what's wrong with it? Come on, Boris. It's like living in John Lewis. It's a nightmare. You're the PM, for goodness sake. You deserve better. You really want to live in this ghastly beige flat for the next ten years? Do you think that the John Lewis comments, which did make their way to the public, do you think that was a turning point? Because it's like, you can do a lot of stuff. People will put up with a lot of shit. But if you're going to knock John Lewis, you're going to have a fight on your hands. Also, John Lewis is... It's posh! Yeah, it's not cheap! It's posh! He stares at her. I get a budget of 30 grand a year tops for renovations. You've blown that on ruddy wallpaper alone. She slinks down. Don't exaggerate. She stares at him in silence for a while. It irritates her when he doesn't take her seriously. She puts away the estimate. Tells him she bumped into her old boss, Sajid Javid, today. I mean, I'm sure most couples have that moment, end of the day. They're in bed together. The pillow talk before lights out. Catch up on major things. But nothing quite as influential as what's happening here, I'm sure. I saw Sajid Javid today. That reminds me, I must get a box of eggs. Must get a box of eggs. <laughs> That's what like... you say just before like, must get a box of eggs. Or like, oh, we're out of detergent. I'm going to go to Tesco in the morning. Is that sad? Yes. Oh, God. I mean, you've been with your other half a while, but Jesus. <laughs> you know Dom's trying to get him out. He's already sacked two of his top advisors. He glances at her. Well, let's not talk about that now. She sits up. Your party used to pay me good money to hear my advice, but you never want to hear it. All I'm left with is choosing bloody home furnishings, and now you won't even let me do that. OK, ponchon for exceptionally expensive home accessories aside, it must be frustrating to be the spouse of the PM, particularly if you felt like you've had direct influence before. Yes, she's not just any other politician's wife. She had a political career in her own right. She was director of communications for the Tory party. Carrie Simmons, as she was, was established in that world. So it must be incredibly frustrating for her. That said, she now has way more influence as the partner or wife of the prime minister than she ever would have had as head of comms for the Tory party. She jumps out of bed and storms into the kitchen, pours herself a glass of water. Looks over at Boris, standing in the doorway in his underpants, looking miserable. (sighs) OK, fine. Go ahead. She smiles at him. Watches him lumber back to bed. Sips her water. She'll ring the designer in the morning. Add that Rudolf Nureyev gold drinks trolley. She doesn't intend to be a wallflower. After all, she's one of the most powerful women in the country. She's going to keep giving Boris her advice. And make sure she gets what she wants which happens to be a Rudolf Nureyev gold drinks trolley. 11th of March, 2020, Downing Street. Dominic Cummings marches into the main office, watches as the Prime Minister's advisers flinch as he barks. Where is he? One of the team gestures to a closed door. Cummings bursts through, sees Boris quickly take his feet off the desk and sit up. Covid forecast figures, you need to announce a lockdown. He watches Boris gesture to him to sit. Oh, Dom, just the man. Take a look at this. Boris pushes a copy of the Times across the desk. Cummings stares at a picture of Carrie smiling at a small Jack Russell terrier. And at the headline, Downing Street dog to be reshuffled. Sorry, did he hear what Dom Cummings said? <laughs> They're saying Carrie's getting rid of Dylan now she's pregnant. It's utter nonsense. She's really angry about it. And people love dogs. The public will turn against me if they think this is true. 
He glares over at Boris, feels his fists tighten, resists the urge to leap across the desk at him. He needs to stay calm. He's been up all night going over the COVID forecasts and the figures are terrifying. Right now, he could do without Carrie's latest drama. Most of all, he needs to get Boris to concentrate. But he's still talking about the dog. Truth is, I can't stand the bloody thing. It shits everywhere and it keeps humping my leg. It chewed a book the other day, rare edition. The housekeeper was bloody livid. I just can't believe that if someone bursts into your office saying you have to shut down the entire country, you're saying, oh, but bloody, you know, Pippin's out in Battersea Dogs Home. Like, I don't care. Well, I mean, I care, all right? Don't all turn on me about the dogs, but seriously. Why do you hate dogs, Alice? Oh, God. (laughs) Cummings has had enough. He taps impatiently on the file. Projected figures for death in the UK due to COVID. If we don't announce a lockdown now, we're looking at between 100,000 and 500,000 deaths. The NHS is going to be smashed to bits in weeks. We've got days to act. We need PPE urgently. You need to lock down now. He watches Boris's eyes dart around the room, then back at the Times front page. Oh, look, Carrie's written a letter of complaint. I, I thought you might want to look at it. Cummings grabs the letter and tears it up. He leans close to Boris. I don't care about the fucking dog story. You will not leave this room until you've read this file from cover to cover. Back in the main office, he barks at one of the special advisors. Call an emergency meeting. Cabinet room. Now. A short while later, he stands at the door as cabinet ministers and their advisors sit around the table. This country is facing the biggest threat since World War II. So, we have new working rules. When you're in a meeting with the PM, you do not laugh at his jokes. From today, we concentrate on this pandemic. Everything comes through me. Every phone call, every email. Understood. He stands, arms folded, glares around the room. Someone sits up, clears his throat. Cummings leans forward, hand on hips. Problem? The minister slinks back in his chair, stares down at the desk, shakes his head. He gives them one last look, then marches out. He'll tighten his hold on Boris and deal with this crisis and make sure Carrie's small fry grievances don't get in the way of him running the country. One month later, central London. Carrie sits in the back of the Prime Minister's car, gazes out of the window as they pass over Westminster Bridge. London would normally be full of people, cramming onto red buses or jumping in and out of black cabs. But the streets are empty, the shops shuttered, and the only car on the road is theirs. She gazes out at the Thames. Her eyes fall on an NHS poster. Coronavirus. Stay home, save lives. If you go out, you can spread it. People will die. I know this messaging was everywhere and we saw it every day, but hearing it again is so stark. If you go out, people will die. The fear, not just of getting it and maybe dying yourself, but worse, passing it on and killing someone, was such a powerful motivator. Yeah, that guilt and that shame was a driving force. And also it meant it was all we could think about. It was all we could talk about. Carrie looks over at Boris, reaches for his hand. He's just been discharged from St Thomas's Hospital. His face is grey. He's lost weight. But he's alive. She's been frantic with worry the last few days. He'd been in intensive care for 48 hours, with two nurses by his side. Doctors told her he'd been given antibiotics, antivirals and anticoagulants, but nobody was sure if he'd pull through. She found out his kids had gone to the hospital to say their last goodbyes. A doctor later told her if he'd turned up an hour later, he'd have been dead. God, I didn't know that. She moves his hand now to her baby bump. We're going to take good care of you, Boris. He smiles at her, but his eyes are sunken and dark. She watches him take out his mobile. Who are you ringing? Dawn, I I need to speak to him. Get up to speed. Carrie stares at him in disbelief. She's only just got him back and he's already seeking Dom's advice over hers. Cummings has been nothing but a thorn in her side over the past year. 
She'd even found out he'd been calling her Princess Nut Nut behind her back. I mean, that's hard to spin, isn't it, once somebody finds that out? It's because you like chocolate with hazelnuts in it. Also, I seem to remember the gossip was that on WhatsApp or on text, they would just reduce it to emojis. So it's princess emoji and then peanut emoji, peanut emoji. Oh, God. She despises him and the hold he has over her husband. Not right this minute, surely. But Boris isn't listening to her. Or gone to bloody answer food. Dom, ring me as soon as you get... She snatches the mobile from him. He can wait. She looks at his puzzled face tries not to get upset. I nearly lost the father of my child, and now all you want to do is talk to him. Stung, she leans towards the window, watching the city morph into leafy suburbs. Just take the day off and rest. An hour later, they sit in front of the open fire in the opulent 16th century living room at Chequers. Carrie adjusts Boris's wheelchair as staff rush to serve them tea and biscuits. He's hardly spoken since he got back. She watches him stare at the flames, takes out her phone and tweets a message of thanks to the NHS and the staff at St Thomas's. She scrolls down, reads him the messages of support. A tweet from the hospital's chief exec asking people, stay at home to help us save lives and protect the NHS. Another from a party donor with an organic farm offering to send food and wine. Isn't that kind? She watches him nod, but his eyes are empty. Even at free food and wine, he must be in a bad way. He glances over at the pile of briefing papers stacked on the table nearby. She stands up, rubs her aching back, and carries the papers to him. Come on then, let's work on this together. Where do you want to start? She's had enough of playing second fiddle to Dom. She's going to get Boris through this, show him what she's capable of, and get Dominic Cummings out of the way for good. It's May 2020, Daily Mirror Officers London, Lockdown 1. Pippa Creera flicks on the lights and walks through the vast open plan office, takes in the eerie silence. The building is normally buzzing with activity, but today the newsroom floor is practically deserted. It's strange to be back. Since the lockdown was declared two months ago, Pippa has been working in her children's playroom, trying to keep the piles of Lego at bay. Only a few journalists are allowed into the office under the current lockdown rules, and today, she's one of them. She adjusts her mask and gels her hands. She's got two hours to file her story. A few days ago, she'd spoken to a nurse who told her they don't have enough personal protective equipment. And a lot of the stuff they've given us is useless. Half the time we have to make our own. Other medics have told her the same thing. Everyone she'd spoken to sounds exhausted and scared. She looks down at her mobile. It's one of her contacts from the northeast. Hello? Hi, Pippa. Look, you're not going to believe this. I, I can't believe I'm saying this myself, but I've just seen Dominic Cummings in Barnard Castle. She leans back, frowns. Are you sure? Oh, I was definitely him wandering around the woods with his family. No doubt at all. She stands up and starts pacing. Dominic Cummings lives in London, so what's he doing hundreds of miles away? The rules from the government couldn't be clearer. Don't travel and stay at home. Other government officials have resigned after breaking these rules. If her contact is right, this could be the biggest story of her career. The lockdown's chief architect caught red-handed, all while the public obey his rules. She snatches up her phone, dials out to a mirror cameraman in the northeast sends him over to Barnard Castle to see if he can get some evidence. Later that night, she's at home reading to her kids when he rings back. Been out all day, there's no signs of him, Pippa, sorry. She spends the next few days ringing her contacts in the area. She needs at least two independent eyewitnesses before she can run this story. But nobody else has seen him. That night, she sits with her husband, watches the news. You must stay at home. We must stop the disease spreading between households. 
That is why people will only be allowed to leave their home for the following limited purposes. Shopping, one form of exercise a day, for medical reasons, and travelling to and from work where essential. If you don't follow the rules, the police will have the power to enforce them. She checks her phone again. She can't understand it. Her contact is solid. They've never been wrong before. So she calls again. Sorry, Pip, I haven't seen him since. Just that one time. She's about to hang up when she hears them say, A friend of mine said the Guardian rang, though. They must have heard about it as well. Next morning, she's having breakfast with the kids. She scrolls through her phone, half expecting to see the story in The Guardian. But there's nothing. Then it hits her. What if they're in the same position? What if they both only have one source each? Contacting another paper to do a joint investigation is unusual. It's usually a race to publish first. But working together might be the only thing that gets this story over the line. And if they do, it'll be explosive. It is so exciting. It's journalists' Avengers Assemble. A few minutes later, she rings her counterpart at The Guardian, tells them she's heard they're looking into the coming story. How do you feel about a joint investigation? Twenty third of May, twenty twenty, Dominic Cummings's house, Islington. Dominic Cummings runs down the steps outside his house and tries to dodge the group of journalists waiting for him. He's been summoned to Downing Street and he needs to get there quick. We in Barnard Castle, while ordinary people were staying at home and obeying the rules, Mr. Cummings. Anything to say to people who couldn't see their dying relatives? He barges past, scowls at them, jumps in his car and takes off. He squeezes the bridge of his nose, tries to relieve his headache. Yesterday, the Daily Mirror and The Guardian ran a joint story about him driving his family to Barnard Castle. He's furious, and now he has to take precious time away from work to limit the damage. He storms into number 10, makes his way to Boris's office. Boris slams the papers on his desk. This is a monumental catastrophe, Dom. He rubs his forehead. Don't state the fucking obvious. I need your full support on this. Get the cabinet out there backing me up, and you need to make a statement as well. Boris erupts. For Christ's sake, Dom! You've really fucked up! We look like a bunch of hypocrites! Boris tries to steady his breathing and glares at a shocked Cummings. I'll do it, but only because I can't do this without you. And for God's sake, keep a low profile for the next few days. There it is. That's the first domino to fall in a series of very compromising denials. This sets Boris's leadership on a path down which it will never recover. Next morning, Cummings wakes up to a group of protesters on the street outside. They hold cardboard signs saying, Demonic scummings must go, along with signposts for Barnard Castle. It's nice. People are very creative. Someone else parades up and down the street with another placard saying, Why are you above the law? Then he hears Boris Johnson's booming voice. You must stay at home. So many millions and millions of people across the country have been doing the right thing. Someone's parked a car outside his house with a huge billboard on top playing clips of Boris and footage of people talking about how difficult it is not to be able to see their family. He closes the blinds, switches on the radio, Here's a series of cabinet ministers defend him. None sound convincing. When Boris gives his statement, he sounds even worse. And he realises. If he wants to turn this story around, he's going to have to do it himself. I know I shouldn't be, but I'm really excited for this. Two days later, he steps into the bright sunshine of the Rose Garden in Downing Street, takes a sip of water, rolls up the sleeves of his white shirt. Now that doesn't seem important. But he didn't have a tie on. He had his shirt, quite a number of buttons open. As you say, his sleeves up to his elbows. He kind of didn't look like he was about to do a press conference, did he? He was sort of at the trestle table of his kind of kid's sports day, it looked like. Sat behind a wallpaper paste table in a garden, like you say, without even a tie on, is not what we are used to as a country, hearing missives from the centre of power. It was just so unusual. And his scruffiness had always been commented on, hadn't it? But in this particular moment, it felt so disrespectful somehow. This guy is just like Boris in the sense that 
They really wear their rebellion. It has to be visible. The scruffy hair, the beanie hat, the rigger boots. This is all part of that language. He's saying, yes, I'm at the centre of power, but I have a different attitude to it than other people I work with. Cummings looks out at the socially distanced press. He spent the night going over and over his press statement. It's his one chance to kill this story. He starts to explain how his wife had fallen ill, how he'd got COVID himself, how he decided to drive his wife and young son to his parents' house in Durham for childcare. My wife didn't want to risk a 300-mile drive home with our child, given how ill I'd been. My eyesight seemed to have been affected by the disease, so we agreed to go for a short drive to see if I could drive safely. He glances up. Everyone suddenly shifted to the front of their chairs. We headed home, but our child needed the toilet. We pulled over and stayed for a little bit in the woods. At no point did we break social distancing rules. I believe I have behaved reasonably and legally. He pauses, thinks of Boris watching him somewhere in the building. I've explained all of the above to the Prime Minister. Unfortunately, we both had COVID at the time and neither of us can remember the conversation in any detail. There are murmurs of disbelief from the assembled crowd. He takes questions from reporters. Does your story not look like one rule for you and another for the rest of us? Shouldn't you just resign now, Mr Cummings? He rubs his chin, frowns. They don't believe him. It's a disaster. What is there to believe? It just doesn't add up. When it's over, he storms into the building, sees Carrie grinning. Well done, Dom. I'm sure they all believed every word. He barges past, ignores her. He's going to front this out, keep the Prime Minister close. And if Boris ever dares to ditch him over this, he'll take him down and carry with him. Nineteenth of June, 2020. A schoolyard, Hertfordshire. Boris stands in the school playground and grins as 30 kids sing happy birthday to him. He's visiting the school to talk about COVID rules. Oh, thank you, everybody. What a wonderful way to spin my birthday. I actually can't think of anything worse. I mean, the lies that come out of his mouth. Would you want to spend your birthday with 30 kids? Do you think they're all his? <laughs> well, it's a family gathering. That's why it was within the law. He's about to leave when a reporter yells, Are you still backing Dominic Cummings, Prime Minister? He waves goodbye to the kids, jumps in the waiting car. He's sick of reporters asking these questions. Dom's already given his account to the press. That should have been enough. Instead, he's had to do almost constant damage limitation. But he's not going to lose Dom, no matter how much grief he gets. He picks up the file Dom left him on COVID stats. He tries to read it, but his phone keeps going off. He scrolls down the happy birthday messages from well-wishers. Messages some back. When he looks up, they're already pulling into Downing Street. He grabs the pages and marches to the cabinet room. He'll lock himself away there for an hour. But when he walks in, Carrie's waiting for him with the baby, and she's with a group of people. Happy birthday, darling. She hands him a birthday cake, iced with the Union Jack. He grins around the room as people raise their glasses to him. He points down at the cake, and a tray of packet sandwiches neatly laid out in a row. Tuck in, everyone. You may not all get a slice, but I see we have plenty of sandwiches to make up for it. He glances across at the pile of papers. He knows he should read them. He's got a COVID strategy meeting in an hour. But there isn't any harm having a beer or two. Besides, it's his birthday. He wants to enjoy it. He holds up his can as someone takes his photo, smiles around the room. Cheers! 13th of November, 2020. During the second lockdown, Downing Street. Dominic Cummings throws open the door of Boris's office. Boris sits up abruptly in his chair, alarmed at the intrusion. Dom, for fuck's sake, not before you come in! He's been summoned to his office with no explanation. But given how tense things have been between them, Cummings can take a guess. A while ago, he told Boris he was leaving at Christmas. The press conference in the Rose Garden shattered whatever relationship they previously had. And now Cummings is counting the days until he goes. He slouches into a chair in front of Boris, crosses his arms and smirks. Well, what's the problem now? Boris interlaces his fingers and places his hands on the desk. 
I brought you in to discuss your general behaviour this week. Frankly, I'm disgusted. Imagine getting that feedback from Boris Johnson. Of all the people. Boris spins an open laptop around to face him. You've been briefing advisors against both me and Carrie. How fucking dare you? I'm the only reason you're here. The only reason you matter. Cummings squints at the screen nonplussed as Boris spits the words at him. You know we're in the middle of negotiations for Brexit. You're trying to destabilise the whole government. Cummings bursts out laughing. Ha! Carrie gave you these, didn't she? Why the fuck do you listen to her? He watches Boris's anger rise as he stammers out a response. I make my own decisions, but actually she's very smart. A lot smarter than you give her credit for. Cummings stifles another laugh. Carrie has increasingly become Boris's first port of call with every decision. A few months ago, Cummings had lined up a press secretary for Downing Street. Carrie's friend, Allegra Stratton, had been hired instead. He suspects that she even had a part to play in his ally Lee Kane's resignation. She was never keen on him taking the chief of staff role once Cummings left. Boris catches him smirking and explodes. I've had enough of you, arrogant, self-aggrandizing, swank pot epiphyte. Get out of my office and never come back here again. Uh, so a few questions for you. Swank pot? I can imagine. Yeah, swaggering, conceited, arrogant person. Epiphyte? Apparently it's a plant that lives off another plant. Oh, like a kind of parasitic presence. Sure. Very nice, very nice. I mean, he could have just said, you swaggering parasite. But this is Boris Johnson. Even when he's angry. So florid. Now, Cummings is filled with a bubbling, irrepressible rage. He pushes the chair back, standing to slam his hands on the desk and sneer into Boris's face. You think you'll survive without me? You haven't got a clue what you're doing. How the fuck have you got this far in life? Boris stands up to meet him, face puce with fury. Spittle flying across the desk as he delivers the parting blow. I never needed you. That's the difference between you and me. You'll always be a footnote in someone else's history. Cummings abruptly straightens up. It's over. A few minutes later, he puts on his long, dark coat, picks up a cardboard box of his belongings and walks down the corridor. He glances into a side room where Lee Kane's leaving party is happening. Right, yeah. OK, two different moods. Watches Boris sweep past and greet everyone. There seem to be parties every week in this godforsaken place. No wonder hardly any work gets done. He looks in now as people sit on each other's knees or stand in huddles, hanging on Boris's every word. Please raise your glasses to Lee Kane. Cummings storms out of Downing Street, ignores the cameras and journalists yelling questions at him. That night, he pours himself a glass of wine, tries to calm down. His phone pings, a text from one of his team. Missed you at Kano's leaving, do? Apparently, Carrie had a victory party in the flat after. Play winner takes it all in your honour. Cummings' jaw tightens. He switches off his phone and vows to be the worst enemy Boris Johnson's ever had. It's early January 2021. London. Lockdown 3. Pippa stands in the freezing rain outside a supermarket, edges forward, stops behind the white line. A few days ago, she'd got an anonymous call telling her Boris Johnson was at a Christmas party in Downing Street. Have you got evidence? She'd heard the contact laugh. <laughs> How about a photo of him reading the quiz? Or the wine fridge that got delivered through the back door last month? Right now, number 10 is Party Central. They even have wine time Fridays. Four o'clock to seven, every week. Hearing it laid out like that, like the schedule of the activities on an all-inclusive holiday or something, the fact that they had happy hour, it just makes you livid still. Giving it a title really suggests that they were aware of how frivolous it was, calling it Wine Time Fridays. It's like the whole thing's a joke. Pippa's been trying to verify the story, but she can't get anyone else to talk. 
Everyone she's spoken to has either denied it or been too scared to say anything. Dominic Cummings breaking lockdown rules was one thing. The Prime Minister breaking lockdown rules is something else. It could bring down the government. But she can't see how she'll ever stand up her source's account. She's been met with a wall of silence. She adjusts her mask now, edges forward a few steps, checks her phone again, scrolling through her emails. One catches her eye. The subject line says, thank you. She's received hundreds of messages and letters since the Dominic Cummings story broke. People have started to write to her with their lockdown stories. She opens the email. It's from a woman whose nine-year-old grandson was in hospital with COVID last year. We got a call from the hospital to say his organs had failed. My daughter wanted to hold his hand as he died. She wasn't allowed. My grandson was a loving, gentle child. I just hope he didn't think we abandoned him at the end when he needed us most. As life becomes more and more normal and we get a bit of distance from these types of stories of people not being able to sit at people's hospital bedsides, of missing funerals, people dying alone, we also get some distance from what those numbers really mean. Thousands of people dying, thousands of people traumatised by this experience. Hearing something like that again you just realise what this meant to people. You realise how let down, how betrayed, and how furious people were. Too many people around Boris Johnson didn't appreciate the depth of that anger or how deep that anger still is. She swallows hard, blinks back tears, takes in the freezing air through her face mask, and walks forward a few paces to the next white line. She might be running into dead ends, but she's going to keep fighting, no matter how long it takes. If those parties happened in Downing Street, she's going to find someone who was there. And when she does, Boris Johnson won't know what's hit him. May 2021, Hartlepool United Football Ground, North East England. Prime Minister, can you kick the ball for us, please? Boris nods at the waiting press, runs across the pitch and kicks as hard as he can. He flew into Teesside Airport this morning. He's come to support Jill Mortimer, the Tory candidate in the local by-election. The Tories haven't held this seat for 57 years. It's a Labour stronghold, but he's determined to change that. He looks up now as the local mayor comes out and gives him a Hartlepool shirt with Boris, number 10 on the back. He looks at the club's slogan at the bottom of the shirt, Never say die. He grins at the mayor, holds up the shirt to the press. We're going to deliver our ambitions to level up, invest in the region, create jobs and wealth, and give the good people of Hartlepool the future they deserve. He visits a chip shop at the seafront, talks about the vaccine rollout, reminds the press. It's been a massive success. I believe the uptake's been the fastest in the world. The chances of our economy bouncing back really strongly in the second half of this year are uh, very strong indeed. He eats a chip. It starts to rain. But the weather can't dampen his spirits. Covid cases are finally dropping. The NHS isn't under as much pressure. If it carries on like this, he'll be able to lift restrictions altogether. And he's managed to do it all without Dominic Cummings. At the wharf, he stands with Jill poses in front of a 30-foot inflatable Boris Johnson with its thumbs up. It's the stuff of nightmares. A gust of wind makes it bob up and down. He turns to Jill, elbow bumps her. Then they both raise their thumbs for the cameras. A few days later, he stands in the cabinet room and watches the live feed of the election. Dr Paul Williams, Labour, 8,589 votes. Jill Mortimer, Conservative, 15,529. He watches the local party activists erupt with delight. He turns now as everyone congratulates him. He stares back at the television, watches his candidate's beaming face fill the screen. It's a 7,000 majority. He smashed Labour to bits, taken another bit of the red wall through the sheer force of his own personality. And now, He's going to demolish it completely. He's overcome with a sense of elation. He's proved once again that he can withstand anything and keep winning. 
COVID, Dominic Cummings, these scandals don't touch him. He's Boris Johnson, and he's unstoppable. COVID was such an extraordinary moment. Of course, unprecedented times was the thing we kept hearing. So it's easy to think that everything was a disaster, but I think that he had so much goodwill in the tank from people that there was a moment where it seemed like he could bounce back. Yes, there was always a sense of fairness from the public that COVID wasn't something anyone saw coming. So some mistakes were forgiven. And before these scandals multiplied, there was definitely a window where he could have stayed and possibly even won another general election. In retrospect, that seems absolutely insane. But you only need to look at what he's behaving like now. He is not a person who ever believes he's dead. Six months later, 30th of November 2021, Pippa Creera's house, London, 5.40am. Pippa lies in bed and stares at the ceiling. She hasn't slept all night. She rolls over, looks at her sleeping husband, peels back the duvet carefully so she doesn't wake him. She tiptoes downstairs, makes herself a coffee, clears the toys away from the floor and sits at her desk. She's been working on the Downing Street party story for 10 months now. In a few hours, she needs to convince her editor to publish it. She reads it again, then once more. She's about to accuse the Prime Minister of breaking the law, so every word has to be right. The implications of this story will be massive. If she's got this right, he could be prosecuted. If she gets it wrong, her whole reputation will be in shreds. She stares at the wall behind her computer. It's covered with dozens of post-it notes with dates, times, places. She's checked over every one of them several times, gathered eyewitness accounts and photographs to back them up. She's double-checked every bit of evidence with an expert in COVID law. She leans back, stares one last time at the photo of Boris Johnson. It's taken right at the time when COVID cases nationally were rising. He's sitting behind a desk at number 10, next to a man in a tinsel scarf and a woman in a party hat. Pippa checks her watch, rings her editor, and then says they have to publish now. It's in the national interest, a prime minister making laws for the country that he breaks himself? She hears her editor laugh. Yeah, but why today? A story only catches fire if we publish at exactly the right time. Pippa's ready for the question. Because the head of Test and Trees has just urged people to limit contact this Christmas. And Downing Street is seeing the opposite. It's chaos. People have made real sacrifices since this pandemic broke. And number 10 haven't. We need to hold Johnson to account right now. There's a slight pause on the end of the line. Send it through. She reads through the article one last time takes out her phone. Her hands shake. She texts her colleague three green face emojis, goes back to her computer and clicks send. This is the fourth episode in our series, Boris Johnson. A quick note about our dialogue. In most cases, we can't know exactly what was said but all of our dramatisations are based on historical research. If you'd like to know more about this story, you can read Just Boris, A Tale of Blonde Ambition by Sonia Purnell, Chums by Simon Cooper, Blonde Ambition, The Rise and Rise of Boris Johnson by Nigel Cawthorn, The Gambler by Tom Bauer, and Boris Johnson by Andrew Jimson. I'm Alice Levine. And I'm Matt Ford. Karen Laws wrote this episode. Additional writing by Alice Levine and Matt Ford. Sound design by Rich Ward. Script editing by James Magniak. Script consulting by Max Stern. Special thanks to Pippa Creera. British Scandal is produced by Samizdat Audio. Our associate producer is Francesca Gilardi Quadrio Corsio. Our producer is Millie Chu. The senior producer is Joe Sykes. Our managing producers are Tonja Thigpin and Matt Gant. Our executive producers are Jenny Lower Beckman, Stephanie Jens, and Marshall Louie for wondering.